there's developments that I'm sure, you know, looking back, we're like, ooh, we shouldn't have done that. You and I both see those developments. Yeah, I think everybody can. I think they're obvious to most people. We're like, oh, let's not do that again, right? Or can we learn from that mistake and not do that again? If you listen to Planning Commission, which probably nobody ever does, but I served on Planning Commission for two years. That is one thing people that had been on Planning Commission before I had, Mm -hmm. it's like, we made that mistake. Let's learn from that mistake. We're not doing that again. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. This is the 435 Podcast. I'm Robert McFarlane. I just finished up with Natalie Larson, St. George City Council member. We talked a lot about a lot of great stuff, infrastructure, energy, and how complicated it really is, uh, what you should know there. We talked a little bit about water, um, spent some time on transportation and, and public transportation, what we should do. Uh, St. George's fair share of, of the burdens that are Washington County. But I think the, my favorite part was talking about loving your neighbor and advice to people moving here from out of the area. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, remember, we're going to drop episodes on Tuesdays. Make sure you like it, share it, send it to people that you know here in Washington County. And don't forget to vote. Uh, August 15th be the primaries. And then November 7th, we'll have you get out there and vote for city council member. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. So what, how is your, your way of communicating and your room presence valuable how do you see it as valuable you know i don't know i'm a youngest child i don't know if that's some of it that, me too that i well there you go i'm an only on boy though i'm an only boy so i was the i was the baby and the only boy so i was spoiled for how many sure sisters two sisters so small family you know in comparison to a lot of people i'd watch this video this guy and this <laughs> husband and wife have 10 kids and i just can't i can't imagine it i can't imagine it. in my head i don't I think that's generations raising generations. My husband has seven children. Like he was the oldest of seven. Mm-hmm. And I watched that family and it's so amazing. There's 18 years and a week difference between him and his youngest brother. And I just watched the care and the love he has for his younger siblings. It's mm-hmm. almost like he got two sets of parents. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I think the parents learn to rely on that. I'm from a family of three as well. So. And that's that. now that you say that, my uh, my sister's 11 years older than me my oldest sister. So there's a big gap between me and her. And she probably more so than I like to admit it. She says she's more like a second mom. And I always like, you're not my second mom. You're still my sister. Right. That kind of a feeling. But truthfully, you know, the reality is that she did do a lot of the raising with me along the way. You know? And she has some different experience closer to your age than your mom did. Right. So actually she did fill that role a little bit and she's somebody else you can Get get some feedback from that's a trusted person who you know has your best interest. Yeah. And not everybody gets that. She's so, going to give me the truth. But, for sure. But from a different age perspective than your mom has. Yeah, exactly. So I think I think that's I think that's the long and short of, you know, big families. I think the, I do hear a lot like after you have three, it's there's no it, it doesn't necessarily get that much more difficult because you end up having you know, a bigger gap, the older one starts kind of taking care of the younger ones and that generations raising generations thing. Um, but I'm, I'm not from an LDS family and, you know, thinking back generations, you know, not even my, I think my grandma, she was born in 1913. She died when she was 108. I think she only had two siblings as well. So, you know, it was like three sibling families for like three generations back. That's how my family is too. And and so then I see, I come and I see these families where they're like, I had 10 kids and my parents had 10 kids and their parents had 10 kids. And I'm just like, whoa, those numbers, they start to crank up. And you think of nuclear, it takes on, nuclear family takes on a different meaning with all those generations to. Yeah. I had eight cousins total. You know what I mean? That's wow, yeah. just one family. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's just. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic though, that you being the youngest, so going back to your presence in the room though, like, where is that a strength? I think I'm a good listener. I, I, when I go to HOA meetings, when I go to different meetings within the community, um, I gain a lot from listening and watching people. Yeah. And I don't know. Um, there's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens that I think sometimes when you're speaking or at the forefront that you miss in the room. Mm-hmm. 
And I don't know, this last week I was just at a meeting that was not a formal meeting, but I was just invited to, you know, and it was an area of our community that's very important and valuable. And there was a population of that community missing that was very obvious in the meeting I was in. And I said, where is this other group at? And they're like... What group are you talking about? It's a Latino group. And it was at an elementary school. Mm-hmm. And and the PTA president was doing everything right by getting some playground equipment fixed. But I said, where is this group of people? Where are they represented? Mm-hmm. Because they kept referring back to this group. And I... Anyway, in the communication with her, you know, there's a little bit of concern and fear and you know, they'll understand the language, even though their children are bilingual, you know, but how do we strengthen that in the community? And I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I would have got all that had I just been up there speaking. Because when I'm sitting back in the room, I'm looking who's missing, what is really being said, what is, what is being said behind what is being said. Yeah. And so I think sometimes that is a strength for me that, that, and I'm able to connect to people like that, that, that on a personal level, that's what's important because we have groups that will bring things to the city, but there's the residents, there's the individual residents. Just like when I pulled up today, there was a resident called me about an Iron Man situation about their parking lot. Not the superhero. He didn't come in and start blasting everything. Not, no. not that kind of Iron Man, different Iron Man. The, right? the Iron Man races. And so, <laughs> and so for me, you know, it was like, it's one little small business that just like, well, how's this going to, you know what I mean? I can't have my bro- blocked off. I can't, you know what I mean? This is a big yeah. day for me. So to me, it's that one person, it's that resident who's got too many scooters on the street or whatever that dares call me and say, hey, can you help me out with this? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's an act, that's an accessibility trait that you have that I think people that typically run for, you know, a political office, right? Like city council or a governing body tend to be ones that are up there talking and not necessarily listening as much as, as they should. And I think that's a strength of yours for sure. When I campaigned, I had boots. I carried my work boots with me because I'm the boots on the ground kind of person. Like I'm the person down there that is working with the people. I'm not, yeah. I'm not setting above them. I'm not trying to lead them. I'm trying to get direction and understanding of the process because that's where I think where a lot is missing. Yeah. So that that's important to me. Well, so... And you'll probably know the story better than I do. Somebody told me that going into the primaries, you had the lowest voter turnout or you had the lowest uh, vote count to get in. But you, you got in, but it was the lowest out of the everybody running. Is that right? And then in the general election, you had one of the top. I was the top. You were the top, right? Yeah. You went from hardly any in Four primaries. Votes. Four votes. Every vote counts. Every Rick, vote counts. Rick Erickson. Agreed. The story behind that is they did the coin flip. Mm-hmm. When they replaced Mayor Randall on city council, and that's when Vardell Curtis got on city council, and it got down, and there were split votes between the council people, so then they had had a coin flip, which ended up being a mess, but it was Rick Erickson, Vardell Curtis, and I, and Vardell ended up, after a couple of days, come, you know, being on city council. Well, flash forward, Rick and I both run for city council and Vardell, mm-hmm. but the interesting part of that is Rick the week before said, hey... Because they start counting votes, and we were up four votes, down eight votes. I mean, it was just flip flop until they got all the votes counted, and we just agreed that we were not going to challenge the vote at the end. Whoever came out, we would. Anyway, and I came up four votes. I came up four votes ahead during the primary. Four. Yikes. Four, and it was the day of that they credentialed the election that that they found it, and it took a week, week or ten days. Can you can you help me understand how do we I saw a booth I didn't go up and ask cuz I didn't have the time to really like ask enough questions to really get get the feel there's a a movement right now to change the way we're doing the voting cuz we started mail in votes in 2020 I think mm-hmm. right mail in yeah. ballots mm-hmm. and that was the first time we had ever done that yes and then and now they're trying to go back so, or there's a group of people that want to go back and vote you can only do it paper day of it's not going to happen. Doesn't it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me do paper day of. I, you always can vote the day of. Yeah, yeah, you but like only making that the only solution because it's not a national holiday. It's not easy. The voting lines are Long. atrocious. Your voter turnout plummets. 
So do you feel confident, though, that the mail-in system is secure enough to where every vote counts? Like you just said, four votes. You know, if, you know, what if we're mailing them to people that don't actually need to get one? Or well, I know I know this from from being in this situation. They do match signatures, okay. They, and it, and you better sign what's on your driver's license, and it better if you do a fancy in on your on your ballot. It's so not it's gonna, driver's license to the voter card, essentially. the voter card. And Got Jimmy it. will tell you during this last election, they called his kids and said, "Who's Jimmy Hughes?" Oh, Jimmy Hughes. That they that they called his daughter and said, "Your ballot doesn't match your signature." You, you know what I mean? Like well, the signature we have on your ballot does wow. not match. And so they come back and they give you a week. And that's what takes the week to clear those votes is they go back and say, we either have, we, you voted in person and you have, we have a ballot here and your in-person ballot's always going to count or your, your, your signature didn't match. And so. So we have, we have a committee of people sitting around tables Shuffling through papers, matching. I don't think they're shuffling through papers. And in the new county off in the new county building, there's a secure area downtown. Our office, I think in two Thursdays, our city council is part of their work meeting. We're going down to tour that because it's a big area to do it. I know when I was talking to somebody at the county the other day, they would really like to get a sorter that will sort it by precinct. So when your ballot comes in, if you're precinct 41, all those ballots immediately will go to precinct 41 that then they don't have to sort them. If there's a question to precinct that they can just go back to that precinct and know it. A hurricane I think is going to hand count this year. And I don't know that hand counting is any better because um, Washington city brought somebody down from the state and they went through the how comes and why and why it's better to have um, the mail-in system and how the bo- votes are counted. But, you know, if you were alive during the hanging Chad thing, if one of those little pieces of paper. I was alive during the hanging Chad thing. <laughs> so then, you know what I mean? And so, at, but when they had. But that was in person too, right? We've always, we've always had this like mm-hmm. voter, how do we count these things? I mean, this is a tale as old as democracy, right? But like, in Washington County, I feel good about it. Nationwide, I don't know. Right. Which, you know, I, and I think that's, I think that's the importance of knowing your local elected officials, right? Is like. When voting is in question, you know, you want to trust the ones at least that are local to you. But it seems like the whole country is like, I trust mine, but I don't trust anybody else's. And everybody else says the same thing. I trust mine, but not everybody else's. And then when you look at the national, you know, statistic, it's like, how does that even match? How do those two things match? How do we all trust local, but we don't trust not local? And they all feel the exact same way. And you can track your ballot in Utah. You know, you put your ballot in, you can go to utah.gov and track your ballot. It's like transparency.gov, I think, too. Like something something easy to get to. They've done a pretty good job, I think, with the Utah website of being able to navigate through it. And they don't count votes till the day of the election. But you can see that your vote, your your ballot was returned. And then, you know, it's counted. It doesn't say how you voted, but. Yeah. So it has your, basically, they scan it in and see, you can see your, your votes. Well, so you you trust this one. Every vote counts. We have an election coming up this year, which is the reason why I'm doing this whole podcast to start, right? Is this city council election leading into the summer. So if you don't know, did I tell you a little bit about what, what the what the plan is and kind of the project that I'm working on? Oh, I want to hear it. So it's like a, a rock the vote. It's, that's the MTV or get out the vote, whatever the thing is. I want to do a, a voter information booth. Um, we're not, it's a, it's a private group of us that all feel the same way about, hey, we need to get the most information out to the public as possible, be able to interview all the different sides, different angles, different topics that are important to us locally. Um, it is St. George because the I want to do a really good job. I don't want to just do kind of a half job. And so I'm just focusing on St. George um, because it does have three seats that are opening up. It's a voting majority swing, right? You know, you could have a, basically a whole new council next year, right? Yes. <laughs> And, and looking at that as an opportunity and also um, it's kind of a challenge to those that are running again, because I'm going to I'm going to assume Danielle, Greg and Jimmy are all running again. When this airs, it'll pro- there are, it'll be after June 7th. So June 7th is the deadline for candidates to enter in the race. So f- the first through the 7th. And then we have until August 15th for the primaries. Yes. And so. The, these episodes will post every Tuesday. 
starting on May 16th. And I'm going to do the five mayors of the five, the five city coalition. And then I'll have um, you and Michelle Tanner on in, in succession, just because after the mayors, you guys aren't running. And then that way it'll, it'll open up for if, if Danielle, Greg and Jamie all want to run again, then I'll do their interviews. And then I want to get uh, the candidates. So whoever wins out of the primaries, I want to get those candidates um, an interview as well. So I can like talk to them and, and ask them their opinion on what's, what's the deal with water and you know, what, how do they feel about economic development and things like that? I think that, I think that's a great idea. I think the more you can do, I think this is going to be the most important for St. George city um, election we ha have had in a very long time. I feel like Michelle Tanner said ever in the history of St. George, this is the most important one. I don't know if that's true. Right I, now it is. I really feel like, I really it's feel like though. Michelle and I, even though we're not always on the same page, we're a lot on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I feel um, the two most conservative candidates, I think were elected this go around. I think um, it'll be interesting to see what happens the next, this next election. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the city, I feel like um, we've got a, Wonderful city manager in place right now. John Willis. Shout out to John Willis. Shout out to John Willis. John Willis. You're a good man. He really is. He's um, thoughtful. The department heads are, for the most part, I think, are really happy with the choice we made. It's kind of a little bit of challenge when you bring somebody within an organization and set them at the top. When they've worked shoulder to shoulder, they know each other well. They know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so when you pluck one of those people out of being one of us and then you elevate them to the the next level up and say now you're going to now you're going to make this organization your own because really um it is his organization as far as staffing goes what he feels comfortable with working with and so you know could that put people a little bit at not at ease no they've come and said you know he has a super good open door policy he wants people to bring their own solutions because it's their own department and he, like he knew his own department, he was a master of his own department. But like when our parks and recreation person comes to him and says, you know, this, that, or the other, or Scott from the water department comes and said, I think we should look at this, or this is a problem, but I think this is a solution. And I think that's where you see people excel when you don't have somebody, um, you know, trying to do your job for you. But John can also tell you you're wrong. He yeah. just told me I'm wrong. He said, I need you to rethink that. I, You know what I mean? Well, it's a, it's a tactician, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you look at the city council as being a governing body and a, a board of directors, right? They're a board of directors with an executive as the mayor. And then you have the – you have middle management, right? There's middle management that's the tacticians. They're the mm -hmm. people that are getting the jobs done on a day-to-day -day basis. And so – it's a tough balance because the city council members rotate through. And sometimes we rotate through too much and too fast. Yes. Truthfully, because then you, you have some, not a lot of stability in that council and in that directorship. Um, especially when we're talking about approving developments and zoning changes and things like that, you know, that can rock the boat uh, quite significantly when you have uh, a city council that I think might not be prepared for the job that's at hand. Right. It gets too fluid. Yeah. And so we need a really strong city manager, in my opinion. And I've heard great things about John. Um, and truthfully, time time is going to be the teller of of the job that he's going to do because it's such a long it's a long process. You know, there's there's developments that I'm sure, you know, looking back, we're like, oh, we shouldn't have done that. You and I both see those developments. Yeah, I think everybody can. I think they're obvious to most people. We're like, oh. Let's not do that again, right? Or can we learn from that mistake and not do that again? If you listen to Planning Commission, which probably nobody ever does, but I served on Planning Commission for two years. That is one thing people that had been on Planning Commission before I had. Mm -hmm. It's like, we made that mistake. Let's learn from that mistake. We're not doing that again. Yeah. And so that, to your point, that's just exactly what you're saying, that, that we can't make those mistakes again. At the same time, we have to be open to change. Yeah, we... What do you think about – let's jump into economic development. So one of the questions on the questionnaire. So I'm, I'm going to – I sent you the questionnaire. I'd, I'd really love if you just do a written version 
of your opinion on some of these questions? Did you read through them all? Or I did read through them all. Were they? Did they seem tough questions to answer, or did they seem pretty easy? But I think there were good questions. Could, I think could there were you write? Questions. Could you write something out? Because what I was thinking is, when they walk up to the booth, they'd be able to say, "I want this person's position on these topics." And so, like, you you tap on you know Natalie Larson and have these this questionnaire, and you'd answer these questions, and then they can get a idea of what you're like, and then that way it's comparing the city council members what their positions are on these different topics. You know, St. George Dues made us do that. They did. Okay. Mm-hmm. They did. They did do that. They sent us some questions, and some candidates chose not to answer some of the questions. I answered them all, but to me, it's an opportunity to put it in writing and not have it off the top of your head. And it's a little more thoughtful, but at the same time, you don't get an opportunity to fully explain your answer with a follow-up. So that's why I was thinking if I did this and and do a conversation like this, and then they could see it in writing as they walk up. Yeah. They could watch the video. Some will, some won't. S- some of the candidates won't answer, which is n- n- no big deal. Um, but I think it's telling when you say, hey, here's a list. Every Potentially everybody's asked these same questions, and you're not, you don't want to answer this one. But you answer this one over here, right? I think that's an interesting, like, I don't know why you wouldn't just answer all the questions. Even if you don't necessarily have a huge opinion on it, at least give your your pitch as to the position. Because I think these are all relevant. So the, you know, water, economic development, infrastructure, public health and safety, housing and res- residential development specifically, and then the nightlife in the city. And, and these are these are off of, you know, I sent you those photos from St. George Word of Mouth. I mean we've we have an unelected unelected digital platform in Facebook that the community uses. Yes. I wish we didn't have that one. I wish we picked our own. But um by default because it was the only option at the time, everybody's on Facebook. And we have all these different we have all these groups and they're all scattered and fractured around and kind of hard to follow, right? But every once in a while you get some good engagement, you get some good feedback from a lot of people that are on there. I think the ones I'd sent you, you know, had a couple hundred comments in some of them and some of them had some, uh, I, I only got the questions. I feel like, Oh, did I not, did I not send you those, mm-hmm. the posts? Okay, here I'll, uh, but I read them. I'll pull I, them I up. do read them. I'll, I'm going to pull it up and I'll hand it to you and I'll read, I'll read it to you as well. Yeah, I so. just got the question here. Oh, dang it. See, I'm it's still, all good. I'm still learning. No, but I, but I, I do read those comments. Uh, and it, cause it's telling, and there's people that are always going to complain that never see the sunrise in at all. But at the same time, back to that point of like, there there are good comments. There's people that are never going to stand up. They're never going to drop an email to me that it's important that I listen to that, that I see their perspective. Because I may not agree with that perspective, but it's still a resident's perspective. Yeah. Everybody needs to have like some kind of a voice, right? Mm-hmm. So... This one had 61 likes. You know, they said, what are the challenges facing St. George's? This this poster's question. And uh, Victoria Graff, if I will, Victoria Graff's stack. Affordable housing, as many people are getting priced out and more pet-friendly rentals. Too many animals get dumped in the shelter for this reason. Higher wages, number two, higher wages that can at least keep up with the cost of living. Number three, another hospital provider to add competition will increase quality of care and also give healthcare workers competitive pay. What do you think about those as issues facing St. George? Do you agree with? Her? Well, you know, the hospital, one of the, a new hospital did at, on Atkinville interchange uh-huh. did. I mean, that is, that went through city council, whether they perform on that and build that hospital, we're not in charge of that, but they did have a rezone done down there off a freeway interchange to allow that. So that is a potential, but we can't drive that as a city. Do you, but do you, just you personally, do you agree with her is that those are three pretty, pretty hot button topics? They are hot button topics. Do you agree that they're, um, like having a second healthcare provider as just a citizen, not necessarily, there's nothing you can do about that. Truthfully, the wages too, you know, as a government, a city government goes. We can't do anything about that. But And we shouldn't do anything about that. We shouldn't do anything about it. But you look at... mm, I'm not going to remember the name of it, but the one off Riverside Drive, Revere Health. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're here. They don't have their own hospital, but they're, they, I mean, that's providers. They use the hospital. There's a surgical center. Coral Desert has its own surgical center. So there are other opportunities for medical workers, for people to see different physicians. We do have that. And with the nurse practitioner and PA 
um, situation, they can, a lot of them can hang on a shingle now. So that is an opportunity, but that hospital, it did go through city council, whether they build that hospital, we're not in charge of that. Yeah. But as far as the economy, we can't force people into bringing business. And um, I think we're going to be a more knowledge base area. I think we're going to see people work more remotely as other businesses allow it to. More liquid office space, I think it's going to be something where something like you're doing here today that people could come in, work their eight hours. They can't, they don't have the office space from their corporation, but they can come in bring their laptop, do their calls, and go back home if their home conditions changed and their kids are too loud Yeah, or whatever. Shout out to Blue Form Media. That's Natalie's referring to Blue Form Media, their home podcast studio in uh, in Santa Clara. Like, I mean, this is, you know, they're a dream of theirs. They were able to use their house to do it, and I think they've done a great job. You know, they're, people are going to adapt as far as, like, economic opportunity and and office space. You know, the one thing with the, with the hospital com- comment is that, you know, that's a subsidy, essentially, right? Healthcare is a subsidy because the hospital wouldn't have been built without taxpayer money. That's that's just a plain and simple thing. And I, I listened to the CEO of IHC um, speak this a few years ago, I think, in What's Up Down South um, meeting, those big, those big uh, kind of conventions, as they will. Yes. And he was saying how, historically speaking, hospitals, they're not profitable. They, they operate a lot of times in the red. Now, whether that's purposefully or whether that's um, um, of uh, it's so expensive to run hospitals. Like if you think of all of the things that has to go into play for them to operate, and a lot of times people come in that can't afford it, right? A lot of people a lot are hurt. Of people that, cannot afford it. Yeah, and and, and it's expensive to be a doctor. It's expensive to be uh, to become a doctor, but then all this equipment and you have the health insurance industry and. You know, they charge the hospital this much, but they could actually charge it this much, but they have to inflate the premium so they can, you know, you know, you know how the, it's a circus, truthfully. Like if you, if you get into the medical and the insurance, it's a, insurance, circus. it's a circus and that's, that falls into the hospital. And we have one because if we had, didn't have the state funding for it, we might not have really any, right? Which we need. We need. We need it. We have people coming here from all over the world. They get hurt up in Zion on bear claw trail or you know the, up they're they're riding their bikes they're four, four wheeling they're doing extreme sports all over the county whether we like it or not and we need a place that can help them when besides they get that we have an aging population on top of it yeah on top of it that needs that extra care um all those specialists that help i know yeah. 10 years ago my son was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic and my son my son was when he was four he's seven now yeah so three years ago and that I don't even see, and you probably have to go to Northern Utah to get help, to get, to, to have, to have a pediatrician, endocrinologist, look at him. You, you're still having to make a drive probably so once they, a year. They do, they do video, they're doing video calls, but I, I haven't, this isn't to say anything about their, them in particular. It's just at a certain point, I think, and you know this, at a certain point you've learned as much as you can learn about it. And now you're, you're having to kind of go outside of the system a little bit to say, Hey, what works for my, my child versus what works for other kids? Have, is that your experience or no? Well, my son was actually diagnosed in Paraguay and was in wow. a coma and came back. Oh my gosh. He was 19. So, he, but he came back 55 pounds lighter and with a, some other health issues because, you know, Paraguay is a different world. And so Dr. Moreno really, um, she was new to the area at that point, wow. but he just filled up with wood because he had, was having some organs shut down. Yeah. So anyway, but um, over the last 10 years, you know, there's things that change. And I think you may see it in your child as they grow, they develop, um, the hormone levels change, they have growth spurts, they have all these things they experience. And to have somebody here locally who can say, put eyes on them and tell them that maybe you do the same thing, but actually put eyes on them and say... I care about you. This is the deal. We got to do this. See this screen. This is mm-hmm. what's going on. Did you, did you eat cereal or pasta that day? This is how you, this is yeah. what you do with your pump. And I think if, if we had to drive to Salt Lake, it would be a different experience. And sometimes you need somebody that day. You don't need somebody in a month. And I, my mother-in-law um, was diagnosed with cancer probably 30 years ago. And she was diagnosed with five different kinds of cancer. 
Oh, and goodness. so um, as we have the cancer people down here are so exceptional. I think if we had to drive to Salt Lake for every one of those procedures, especially she passed away this last year, but she kept having to have ports and stuff put in her every three or four days to keep her comfortable. If that drive was to Salt Lake, the, the expense for the individual, you know, and she would have passed away much sooner because she wouldn't have got the care. Yeah. So when we look at that, like what a benefit that hospital is, no matter who owns it, to the community, how much we yeah, value that. Agreed. And really, it is part of our economy. A lot of people work at the hospital. Well, so I think what the segue, the segue for me in this conversation, first of all, I'm sorry about your mom. My mom, it's my mom-in-law, but she's, mom she was awesome. Yeah, that's tough. Everybody's, everybody's impacted by cancer or something like that. And, you know, diabetes, it's, it's scary. So my son was four when he was diagnosed and we caught it. My, my wife, oh my gosh, uh, thinks I, tr- truthfully, I think God gave her the, the tingly spider sense. Right, like there's a problem. The mom, the mom, yeah, it's for sure. I, if it was just me, there's not a chance I would have diagnosed him correctly, and and potentially could have lost him, right? Because just a few months know? before, how did she know? So he was wet in the bed quite a bit and drinking a lot of water, and so we're like, buddy, just let's hold off on water before bed. dinner now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And one one night, right before bed. We had him go to the bathroom and wash his hands, and he was drinking out of the faucet. I, not that the water's not good enough to drink out of the faucet, but like we don't drink Did water out of the faucet. And I'm like, what's wrong, buddy? He's like, I'm just so thirsty. And he was just dying over it. And my wife immediately, she's like, I think that's a symptom of type one. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, she didn't sleep all night. I was leaving to Lake Tahoe the next day. I said, let's call Dr. Merkley, our, our pediatrician. Um, she called him the next morning, immediately got him in. They took him immediately to the ER. His glucose level was a high 500s, which normal is a hundred or let, you know, or between less. 80 what, to a hundred. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, he was at 500 and he probably had been at 500 for a week at that point, depending on when, you know, how long his pancreas had started to shut down. So a, a little girl, four years old, she had, she had passed away just months before because little miss kaisi my neighbor it's heartbreaking because you i think as parents was that 10 how, how long ago was that how long was your son diagnosed so this was he's seven now so three years ago oh then it wasn't kaisi but yeah so oh. and, and even even kaisi because i think i've heard a couple of times when i tell the story you know at four years old somebody had just passed away you know because the hospital had told us somebody had passed away you know, that story is just so it's true. And, and it happens all the time for, you know, for type one diabetics. And, uh, it's been, it's been tough. We've, we've had a good system. IHC's done a good job for us, you know, especially on the training and understanding cause he can't do it himself. Right. And I'm sure your son at 19, especially going into a coma, the, the organ shut down, like that whole thing. I can't imagine, right. Being 19 and figuring it out. But as a parent now, you know, he's, he doesn't have the capability to take care of himself, right? He's terrified. He doesn't even like poking his own finger still, right? And so, and we don't have a pump yet because he's so little and there's not a lot of fat on him. No so fat. like the the glucometer, you know, the constant glucose monitor doesn't really work. The Dexcom doesn't work. It, it works uh, enough, better than the finger pokes every single day, but also the pump is relying on the yeah, Dexcom talk, to talk. work together, right? Talk to each other. And so, and then he's hormone levels and growing and his excitement levels. You can tell when he, he gets anxious, his glucose starts to go up, right? Like there's so many factors that go into it. It's not just sugar and, and carbs. It's amazing what bodies do. I, yeah. I remember my son. How complex they are. He he realized that he had a, like his blood sugar would spike sitting in a class deciding whether or not to answer the question. I mean, because you really you feel it coming up. Well, you release some glucose when you need the energy and the the firing yeah. stimulation in your brain. He's like, and... I haven't ate. He goes, and all of a sudden, I'm at 150. And it's like, I haven't even eaten anything for two hours. Like, how does that happen? But pretty soon you realize, I mean, you get to know your body. Yeah. They get to know their body, I guess, not me. Yeah. Well, and, and for my wife, because she lives, you know, she lives every day thinking about it every day at every moment. And in the middle it's of on the her, night. It's on, her, uh, it's on her Apple Watch, which is awesome. In the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. Now, in the middle of the night, that's like her time. She gets to shut down and I ha- end up helping out in the middle of the night. So I get up like two o'clock every morning just to just to check where he's at. 
sometimes two, two or three times. Last night I was up three times. Yes. Because he went, he went low, and so I had to wake him up and give him sugar and see where that went. And then he went up and then came right back down. So immediately after, you know, it was like three forty-five. I'm back up again, you know, trying to get him through the rest of the night because there's not like a simple hey, just give him this, and then all of a sudden he'll make it through the night. Because I also don't want him to shoot through the roof, give him a, a bunch of carbs or a bunch of sugar. And then he goes up to 400 because then now his body's trying to get rid of it and he wets the bed and all kinds of stuff. Right. So it's, it's so this have roller coaster. phenomenon. Does he have that? I don't know what that is. That, um, my son, when he stands up, like he wakes up and gets out of bed, his blood sugar will raise. Oh yeah. Uh, on he its does own. That, yeah. Like he doesn't have to eat. So that was one thing we had to work on is he had to work on, not me. But like wake up, sometimes you go downstairs to have that little bit of chocolate milk or your cracker or whatever you're going to have. Mm-hmm. But his blood sugar would just elevate because he woke up because you reach a little glue's close in the morning when you mm-hmm. wake up, then that just on its own. So then he would be a little bit high because he drank a little bit of chocolate milk or the cracker besides he woke up. So then. Yeah. So, so it's so, really like knowing all these little intricacies. Nuances. But so, but so going back to kind of health, public and health and safety. You know, we had this tax conversation around needing police workers. And then, you know, I went I went to the Salt Lake Tribune had like a community meeting at Utah Tech about housing affordability specifically and, and what the challenges are here locally and and make sure that and I I'm a knowing the Salt Lake Tribune. Typically, it's a very narrow Slanded. it's a very narrow window of people that are going and speaking and, and talking to. Um, which I wasn't quoted in the the article. However, I was outspoken as as I tend to be. However, I wanted to go and make sure that I was like, hey, I'm going to represent the facts that I know to be true for sure, and at least make sure that the the people reporting on it gets get something outside of their narrow window. But it was brought up to me that our nurse nurses at the local hospital we can't hire nurses at our own hospital, even though we're cranking out, you know. 300, 400 plus nurses every semester out of the Utah Tech. And we can't even hire those to come work for us at the hospital because the affordability to be able to live here and be, a, you know, entry level nurse position, they, they don't match, right? They don't have a place to stay. So they end up going somewhere else because they can't stay here. Do you think that's, do you see that as the same or do you see that perspective? I do see that perspective. I, that, I have... I do see that perspective. At the same time, I don't know how local government resolves that issue. Mm-hmm. I have often questioned with these larger organizations if it was a problem, because if you've been to the hack meetings, I've been to the hack meetings, that sometimes I think if you're a big corporation, why don't you create some housing with some deed restrictions yourself? That if that is part of working for me, that we have this housing you know, it may not be everything you dreamed of in a house, but it's a place to start. Mm-hmm. Then when you sell that house, you take so much of that equity with you when you go. But that is actually part of your benefit package. That, yep. that if Housing. You, yeah. That if you have this, that it's almost subsidized renting or whatever, mm-hmm. but you or you own the house. And then when you deed restrict it, you can only go up 3% a year. And so it stays in that pot of housing. You know, what's interesting is that at that point, a local... Um, restaurant owner is doing that specifically for his own employees at the restaurant level. And it's not like he's not a multi-million dollar organization like IHC or billion dollar organization like IHC. He's just a local entrepreneur. It's like, Hey, I see a need and this can be a benefit package to me. Why isn't IHC? Why don't you think IHC is doing that? I'm not in charge of IHC. I can tell you from the city perspective, because I've asked this question, like you could build a house with a carport. You can build apartment buildings. You can build all these other things. Some of the issue is, and you sell real estate and I sell real estate, is mm-hmm. is it not nice enough anymore? Is, you know, I, my first house had Formica and vinyl flooring and had asphalt shingle roof and had a carport and a yeah. 0.18 lot. And a lot of times people want to live in something nicer. With granite, granite countertops. Mm-hmm. Or, or quartz Tile or whatever, floors. those kind of things. But it's like, this is not your ending spot. This is your beginning spot or mm-hmm. where you're on life's journey. Until you get to the next spot, but I've also I've I've wondered how come those larger organizations who are part of the conversation those meetings do not step up unless they just don't want to be involved with it because I do think nurses are not the only ones. There's a 
I mean, you look at school teachers, you look at our firemen, our policemen. It's all all blue collar, all blue collar workers that we have a difficulty. We have the we're turning. We are. We've always been. I think, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I have and have not town for the last probably ten years, fifteen years. We've started to carve out the natives and the working class, right? Probably last 10 years since, since the, the market crashed and w- all those people lost all their homes, all those foreclosures and all the framers and construction workers had to go to North Dakota and to, go work in the oil fields yes. and then never came back. Never they never came, came back. back. So we, we hollowed out, you know, the, the working class that was here and now we're, they're having to come from other areas and the luxury has moved in and now we just have these multi-million dollars. The average price of a home is over $600,000. It's, it's ridiculous. You, you do have to say though, like when my parents, I mean, we moved here when I was three years old. So you do the math on that. You decide how old I am. But when we moved here, um, my, I was born in Iron County in Cedar, mm-hmm. but my dad was hired to be the athletic director at Dixie Junior College. Even at that, and the, that junior college didn't pay a pile of money, but my mom worked as a elementary school teacher my dad was athletic director and my dad drove park the bus for the parks during the summer and my mom did some other things to fill in the gaps and that was two professional people back then and we only had three kids Mm -hmm. so it's never been a super affordable place to live Mm -hmm. even back in the dark ages when i was a kid i mean most people like my husband and i we've always been a two-income family he's probably worked. I mean, even though we own our own businesses, he had to own, own then more than one business. So it is, um, we love living here, but it is expensive. And you're probably going to have to work more than most people to live here. Yeah. It's part, it's part of its the dynamic island charm because we're an island, we're a desert island in the desert. Yeah. There's- so unfortunately, there, and there are, are great people who move, move in, who have second homes, who, you know, to love living here, but they're not going to work. And that's where we're short is the actual people who work. Like Ivan's, who doesn't have any commercial really, and they've built the big resort out there, and then they want more transportation from Suntran, but there's no nowhere for those people to live. The, the Black Canyon Resort. Where, Black Desert. Black Desert. Where are, they, where are they supposed to live? That's a good question. Where are they supposed to live? And they're not going to be high wage, wage earners. Do you mean, a so lot of them. So why why they're developing that project? Why didn't they buy another piece of property and say, you know? I think Sitla wants to do short term rentals on that part, piece of property. Sitla can't do anything but sell things for the higher price thing for the best thing That's for it. the school district. I, I disagree with you there. Something. As Sitla has a mandate from the state, they can do whatever they want. They don't. They they have to serve the needs of the mandate that was given and the charter that they have which means they don't have to do it for the highest possible. They have a $3 billion endowment, $3 billion. That's a good question for Greg. Ah, it's a great question. I'm definitely going to talk to Greg about that, yeah. right? Where, where, But to the point, to your point, is that the developers have this idea, and if you build it, they will come maybe? Mm-hmm. Do, do you think that's the thought? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know that, but I don't know that government solves the issue. I, I look what, at be- what, does, what is the role of government in affordable housing from your perspective? That's a loaded question. I don't think we should subsidize the housing. I have an issue with that, even with the rollback of what just happened with interest rates, you know, the, how they've made it. So if you have a poor credit score that you get a better interest rate than a higher credit score now, that is backwards to me. But I don't think that's the, that's necessarily the case. Exactly. Okay. What is the Cause case? I, Cause I think their, their costs, their upfront costs on a loan are yeah. more. So they're qualifying for a lower interest rate. Yeah. From my perspective, this is this is how it works. They're, the fee for the loan is going up on the front end so they can qualify for a lower interest rate where that doesn't necessarily apply to a higher credit score earner, but they're also already buying down their rates. So it's giving an opportunity to where if you have the money and a low credit score, you can get a lower interest rate. Um, and the credit score isn't what's holding you back from being able to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that's more of the the equaling out. Do I agree with it? No, because I think it's just it's 
it's just instead of you have a straight road, you're like, ah, I'm going to curve it a little bit to the left, right? You end this slippery slope. You start doing this, set this precedent to where now credit score doesn't matter. Now you've made this muddy water where now credit score actually has its own unique, you know, uh, qualification yes. strategy, yeah. which when we started doing that last time in subprime loans, that's when we got into, into trouble, right? So it's, you know, the private markets doing whatever they can and being facilitated by the federal government who is encouraging this, right? Yeah. Because they're ultimately at the top to make exceptions. So I, I don't agree with the premise. However, to the point for those that have lower credit scores, I don't think it's coming at the cost of the ones that have a better credit score. Because I think that was the that was like the marketing headline was like, if you have a better credit score, you're getting screwed. And I don't know if that's true. I guess we'll see. We'll see how, how it works out. Because uh, Matt Hickman wrote, mm -hmm. sent the email. Yeah. Like, did you read that? I did not read that. I'll have to read my and It kind of clarifies it a little bit. Is it the... There's more to the story than that, um, but potentially the shakeout does end up being how long do you run this? Because ultimately they're saying interest rates are going to come down to where uh, the market, you know, prices will come down low enough and interest rates will come down low enough to where affordability gets back into kind of equilibrium. That's their goal, right? That's what they said their goal is. I have no reason to believe that's not the goal because truthfully, that'd be good for everybody. Um I don't, I don't like the idea of going that route, but I think there's way more to the story than just the headline that I've seen. Okay. I, I look back to that though. I think, I think I hate to get too much into deed restrictions, all that other stuff, limiting people on what they can do with their property. I look at different ways, you know, zoning can work. I think, um, I heard mayor Staley say the other day, how off exit 13, they put a whole lot of apartments right there. Mm -hmm. And, that should, probably should have been spread out in their community a little bit more. The Long Valley Project looks a little bit different. They did smaller lots, smaller footprints, trying to make that more affordable. Mm -hmm. So I think as generally we look at um, how St. George's developed, you know, larger lots, we're going to see that come down. You know, the vertical building, people don't always love that, but we're seeing more of that. If you go down Dixie Drive, there's been a lot more – um, that along that ridge line on the west side, see a lot more apartments along that. So I think we're seeing that. I, one of my favorite um, little communities is is Darcy or Tim Stewart's project right by Lynn's. And then you have the reserve that sits behind it by Moreland Park, off Mall Drive, 3000 East right there. Mm -hmm. And you have apartments, you have twin homes, and you have really beautiful homes. And it's a great neighborhood. And it just shows yeah. that like that's how old St. George was. That could still work. Yeah. It's just getting the the neighborhood to say, this works for us. We can mm -hmm. make this work. And I think hopefully we see some more of that because it'll offset some of the stuff for developers where they can put a little more density into a neighborhood, make it a little bit more affordable. But at the same time, we don't control that price. Right. We don't, you know I mean, um, I've known some builders who went in and tried to build some affordable housing in the last two years and they pre-sold some units and before they got their whole project even into phase two, phase one has sold for more than they had anticipated selling phase, the, the next phase for. So we can't control the pricing on that either. Right. Yeah. And I don't think you should. Subsidies don't make sense to me either. Right. Because it's ultimately it's coming back. It's, yeah. it's going to come back to, to cost yes. everybody more money for something that um, I think truthfully it's a zoning. It's a zoning in a, a deed restriction type scenario. It seems like the zoning map and the, especially the downtown map, you know, when I look at the proposal and the five zones, um, you know, they, they've kind of changed the names of what zones are versus historically speaking. And yes. then, and then um, we have some mismatch. They were like, Hey, this is a house, but it's a commercial, but then it has a residential overlay on it. And there I've seen some stuff that doesn't quite have continuity between it. It seems like we've kept changing directions a little bit on the, on the zoning map, at least downtown. I've noticed that, but you know, we've gone to this master plan, you know, large development, you know, scenario so yes. far recently. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, how the city's navigated, you know, tech Ridge? Cause you have a little bit to do with black desert, but it's only we a small portion of it that's, that bit. falls into St. George. We just paved the roads to it. Yeah. So we just get to pay that part. St. George city does. So, Right. 
which is an an interesting conversation, right? When you say who's pitching in on what and and how, right? My favorite calls are the people who say that Snow Canyon Parkway is such a rough road, and Dixie Drive is such a rough road, and you guys need to fix it. And I say, where do you live? We live in Ivins in Santa Clara. I'm like, don't worry, we'll put a toll booth up there, and you can help pay for it. Because it is the road home, you know, and it's not their tax dollars who pay for the infrastructure right there. Yeah. Well, and, and this is a, this is where it goes back to the the five city coalition, right? Like this is as much as St. George is the big brother um, or the, you know, the, the, hub. the patriarch, the hub, right? Whatever it is. Um, all these other cities, you know, have to strategize their way through it. And if you're just a residential community, the you know, financial burden, but also the tax dollars go back to St. George. So then how do those, how do those moving how parts? How do the tax dollars go back to St. George? Well, if, if the employment, right, the retail, the, the, mm -hmm. all of the industry, cause there's no jobs in, in Ivan's. So where are they getting their tax money from? For, that was the choice theirs? they made. Right, right, but, but the question still being, they don't have any opportunity to get tax revenue because they don't have any retail in there. So St. George is basically, you know, the employer of these bedroom communities, right? Yes. And so there's a quid pro quo that happens a little bit back and forth. And then where do we draw the line in that, right? Like with the roads, infrastructure and water and sanitation and And even at that when you when you break down tax, St. the county really is the one who benefits most from sales tax and transit room tax and all that. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who hold the purse on that. Yeah. St. George City maybe gets one gets one percent guaranteed of the transit room tax. And you see Ivan's now they're gonna start collecting on that. Santa Clara, I can't decide where Santa Clara and Ivan's left, but they have a lot of vacation rentals that they're gonna collect that money on. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to recreation and fun, people come back to St. George mm -hmm. because we're about to have fifty parks in St. George. So when you look at that, we we carry a lot of the parks. burden on that oh, and, yeah. and Sun Tran. And even the homeless shelter, you look at that, it's like, mm -hmm. we bury, we have the whole brunt of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful thing. That resource center is a wonderful thing. But every one of those communities benefits from it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think those are the things. And, you know, we used to live in a climate of people knew each other. It was a handshake deal. Now we're looking down and saying, and you know, and I know, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. That's right. And so now we have some of these loose ends and loopholes that... To your point you made earlier, we have, you know, different commissioners, different city council, different attorneys, different administrators who are going off of conversations that have been passed through the last 20 years. And now we're trying, as we get another, um, the school, even the school board, the superintendent school board's changing. Yeah. So we share parks with the, with the school district in a couple locations and how we've maintained them, how we replace equip equipment there. You know, we need to get that ironed out. Those are some things that are important to me. Yeah. Because it, it builds it builds community and it builds those relationships that we have to have. This community was built like that. You look at the flooding situation this year. If you've looked at St. George versus if you look at Washington County. I was in the meeting the other day to say, just call it Dixie because then you know it's all Washington County. But if you look what's happened in Washington County and you happen with Northern Utah – and you look what happened in the previous floods, the mm -hmm. big floods that have happened in Washington County. We've learned a lesson. And um, Mayor Rosenberg. Rick Rosenberg? Yeah, I say wrong. Rosenberg. Rosenberg. You know, he has been the leader of the pack. He's on the flood control He's board. also a civil engineer, right? Yeah, but yeah. I sit on that board good, with him. Good to have a, a guy like that in, but, <laughs> sitting in that seat, truthfully. But that's part of the leadership, you know, that this, this county has. But, you know, he, I feel like even though he sits on that board, he's taken that upon himself. And you look what happened with the water that came down so far this year. Has Santa Clara had one problem? No, not even. So if Santa Clara doesn't have a problem, what happens to St. George? I don't know. St. George doesn't have a problem. Yeah. Because that goes back to that. We're one big community. We're one big county. You look what's happening up in northern Utah, if you watch the news on that one. Oh, yeah. Their culverts are filled up with debris. They have water coming out of the bank because it's been diverted. And that's just what happened the last time we flooded, it's running it, down the streets. It's running down the streets instead of. But water gets diverted by those trees, by the debris, and all mm -hmm. those other things. But, but that board has taken control of that. They've cleared those waterways. Um, this last meeting we had, um, the stuff that is, the work that has been done over the last, really, it's probably been fifteen years, 
to clean it, to shore up those banks, to plant those willows. Well, 2005 was the last time it was like, oh, well, shoot. That's... I think 2011 or 2012, we had a oh, pretty good oh, winter. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had that too. And so we've, we've picked up those lessons. We've put them into action. But it's taken the whole county because at Confluence Park, where those waterways come together, and Sunbrook always floods. And what are we going to do about that? But the same thing happens at Fort Pierce. Mm-hmm. And that's at Project St. George City. But, you know, the your mayor has worked on that been right right with us on it but like saint george this year our staff is pretty epic because there's a lot of money in the budget to clear one of those islands out of the river out of the wash Mm -hmm. because if you if you have an island middle of the wash the water diverts and you end up with trouble so one of the guys at our office said if we gave one of these if we put it out to bid for twenty five thousand dollars you could take all the material you want out for four Mm -hmm. months you can all that dirt you could take out as much as you want over I don't know if it's four months, but a period of time for twenty five thousand dollars. That saved flood control three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. If not more. Property damage potentially. But, but, but I'm stuff. just saying, but like yeah. the cost to extract that because because the way people are thinking, because the way the budgets are working, like people are looking like, how can we do this differently? I think that is something that's good that's happened in the city of St. George, is that we have looked at like rather than raising the budget, how can we Utilize the resources. And I think that is a really good thing I can say about staff is the way those um, department heads work together, our streets division, our water, our utility services, they all work together. People say, why do three people show up? Well, because usually there's a street guy, a power guy, and a water guy trying to assess the damage in the road, how it's affecting them. But they work well together. They're well, willing to overlap. Mm-hmm. And But I think you see that in the county. I think it's so important that we keep those good – community relationships yeah but people gotta start paying their way yeah we all we all have to we all have to chip in but there's only so much too that we can do on on the tax base side but but thinking smarter about the budget too when we want like like you were telling me about the bond right and and this the geo bond the geo bond and and some of the things i haven't done as much research as I should, as much I as I am as informed as I can be, there is still things that are just outside of my reach, which is why I'm so grateful to have city council members and, and mayors that, that There's a lot for donate everybody. their time because it's essentially a donation, right? Kind like of, what, I feel like it sometimes. I think yeah. I think everybody would agree. I don't think any city in in the world, any sitting city council member would say, hey, this is totally lucrative and I totally make a ton of money from doing this. No. They don't say that. It's informative. It's informative, right? It's informative. Well, so, you know, the I'm I'm curious about we talked about uh, a little bit of infrastructure, economic development, water, housing, nightlife in the city. What what which ones are you passionate about? You you definitely said infrastructure and, and I love those... infrastructure. I yeah. love I think it's just so black and white for me and um when you look at like the project that's coming on 1450 South, also known as GW Boulevard, I don't love George that. Washington. Yes, I don't know why I don't love that name. I mean, it's long. I don't know. GW Boulevard. Mm-hmm. GW Boulevard, but but it is it it is going to be is it, is it better than like the whole subdivision of um, video games? Isn't there like a Halo Street and like uh, a probably. But when you look at that, you look at that and you think, you know, that's going to take some pressure off River Road, off Riverside Drive. And I look at the um, 700 South Interchange that they want to put in. Oh, yeah. I'm like, why can't we wait five years? Why does Utah in such a hurry? I know they're widening the freeway to three lanes and they want to do it all as one project. But and that, that would give <clears throat> direct access to the hospital, right? I mean, you'd get, a, you'd get an exit that would take you... You know, basically to the hospital, the university, and all that. But if you live down in Morningside Park, mm-hmm. and it and it empties right into your neighborhood, mm-hmm. you know, is it th- so thrilling for you? Morningside's and, a really nice neighborhood too. And if it's a lot of great it, houses in there, it, it is. But then you have the freeway. You know, they're concerned about what comes off the freeway right there. Yeah, as 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 I, as I understand that that makes sense. And but you look at the backup onto River Road when you're trying to get on freeway. Um, off the boulevard right there, that intersection, it'll back up, you know, to target sometimes trying yeah. to get on the freeway. So trying to relieve the pressure off that, but I'm like, why can't we just see if that 1450 South George Washington Boulevard, why can't we see if that would work and take some pressure off? So people would take that exchange coming off and 
if you lived in the south part of St. George, use that roadway, then come in off the boulevard exit. Mm -hmm. And why not see if that works before we get into 700 South? Yeah. I I mean, I think of those big projects, those big road projects, and think, okay, what, how do we reallocate that same money differently as far as transportation goes? Um, what do you what are your thoughts on, you know, the the bus system systems and and thinking of public transportation? You know, are we are we thinking far enough outside the box or are we thinking, hey, well, let's keep doing a bus system because that's what we know and that's that's what we've done in the past? I think um I think it really belongs to the state. I don't think this I don't think St. George City should be running that for the county either. Yeah, but not for the county, but but, but as it, far right as right now like, it does, like we're buying six buses to go to Zions. Interesting. So okay. I so I you know and it's it's state money or whatever, but why is St. George City running that? Why are we servicing those buses? It's one of those things again, it's like why is this in our pot? Every UTA does everything else. Why? Why are not? Why are they not taking care of this? Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I just don't. I just why think, aren't they? Why do you think they aren't? Because we started it, and they only see tell about Iron County. Even it's like if, an argument. You started it. No, no, you started it. Well, we needed something, but but if you looked, um, if you look at their charting, really up until two years ago, didn't even show anything for mass transportation for. Washington County. And Sean Guzman, who's over government affairs, he really stepped into it and helped us out a lot with that. But, um, you know, they want to bring a train system in from northern Utah and have it go all the way to California. I mean, that's on a long term plan. Have it run along I-15, which, you know, it would alleviate a lot of traffic from here to California, which would be nice. But would I, it would it actually alleviate a lot of traffic? If people rode the train? Yeah. Do you think they're going to do it? Oh yeah, on the East Coast they do it all the time. On the East Coast, but those are that's a different people than those people that live on the East Coast are definitely different than people that live on the West Coast. Wouldn't you agree? But we're seeing more people transition into our community. Are they are they really using the train like say from Provo to Salt Lake? Has that really impacted? I know I have had friends who have done that. Who who's like, do it on a regular basis though for work? Yeah, or school. I, I guess I haven't done any research to see if like what's the I mean, is it is it making itself money or is it just costing money? I think and it's then... costing money, but Danielle's all. I mean, Danielle's the expert on that one. But I, I just went down Sunset and I see that bike lane painted in, and I just about had a moment because I just think it's such a dangerous roadway. Anyway, we've had three fatalities last year on that with pedestrians, and then we had a bike lane onto forty five mile an hour traffic. As I mean, the transportation we have all this trail system. Like I'm mm -hmm. lost for that. Explain. What do you mean? I, we have a trail system in the community. I feel like you can go to most places on a trail. That is the intent of the trail system. I was driving down Snow Canyon. I, so I got up, uh, you know, took bluff up to the top, turned left on Snow Canyon, mm -hmm. started to drop down. And there's the the full, it's like a full paved mini road next to Snow Canyon. Yes. And the bike bicyclist was riding right on the white line. It, like basically in my driving lane. Yes. Going down Snow Canyon and not on the the clear trail on his side that would take him exactly to where he's probably wanting to go anyway, but he's not on it. Exactly. He's, he's on the street. But it, but the like, elevation the elevation on those trails isn't the same. Like they're not, you know, they go up and down and round and round more than a regular road. But that was what I would think would be in the tent of the trail would be. Is... Yeah, that's, it's a trail, not a thoroughfare, right? It's mm -hmm. This is a recreational thing. You shouldn't be, I mean... Get on a motorcycle then and go the speed limit. And, right? be, like, oh. and be safe. And be safe. Yeah. Wear a helmet. Well, they uh, most, I, I, I rarely see people without helmets. But, uh, but, but to me, to me, that's one of the, that, but you go down sunset and you see that bike lane striped in this morning. Yeah. It's, it's an interest. It's an interesting thing. I, my thoughts, we, we're like, uh, we have canyons all over the county, right? And yes. it makes, it makes transportation very difficult and very expensive. We also have a, a ground that moves around a lot. Um, you know, it's a volcanic area on top of the fact we do deal with flash flooding. And so maintaining the roads, it's not cheap just because it doesn't snow here. doesn't mean it's, you know, uh, all that much. There's probably just as much cost in maintaining some of that stuff. Well, we, I think we have, I have to look, I think we have 350 miles of a roadway just in St. George that we have to maintain. Wow. Which is a lot to maintain. And, um, if you've been down by the airport, you're going to see we have to replace another piece of property. I mean, another, um, 
another piece of section down by the new high school. Mm-hmm. It's all rattlesnaked out. So, I mean, you start replacing roads. The Dixie Drive project was $13 million we had to replace. So it is expensive. Yeah. And I think um, we have more traffic signals than anybody in the state, state that we have to maintain just because of all those reasons you just said, because we have all these Turns mountains, and- rivers, I-15, yeah. all those other things. And those are $350,000 cost to the city. Now if they're on Bluff Street or they're on Sunset, they belong to the state. But, you know, that's a lot to keep track of, too, and to maintain just the general maintenance on them. So I have, I have an idea. I, I said this with Michelle, too, so I wonder. I probably won't say it every time. This is my idea on the public transportation. So we have all these trail systems. Um, you know, thinking of what, what does, like, a modern uh, tram look like? You know, it's, a, it's, it's a, a rail electrified with a pod, right? Whether it looks like a vehicle or not basically six seats and could you run a tram system that's not necessarily, you know, natural gas buses or even electric buses, which are extremely expensive, right? We talk about those six buses. I can't imagine how much those cost. Could, could we rethink maybe some of the connections? Because like we, we went down to the kite festival, but we we're in Ivan's and I was thinking, you know, Hey, I'd, if I had like a little tram that I could jump on to get down into St. George from Ivan's, it's actually all downhill too. So the, the, the electricity to get it up and going and then just stay on a trailway down into St. George and back on a Saturday, I would much prefer to do that rather than try to find parking and hit the 16 lights that are between Ivan's and, um, you know, Utah tech that, that seemed to me like if, if you could put something like that together, what would the cost be on something like that? But I, I can't help but think, that is something that if we rethink just the bus, because all we're doing is adding more to the road, right? With the bus, there's stigmas around the buses. You hear, you know, the, I've heard the social conversation, which I don't necessarily agree with. is like a stigma with, you know, riding on the bus and, and things like that. But are they getting utilized? No, they're not. They're not. They're, they don't. I fe- I really somebody could- would say, I'd rather just walk or I'll try to get an Uber or like they'll try to do something else. And the bus is like the last resort. Cause it's like, okay, well then I got to get a bus pass and uh, I don't even know how to do that if they've never done it before. And then doing it all the time, it's, it's takes a while. Well, you, part of the problem fast. with the bus system is, is it, you have to drive all the way around the community to get, it's not like a straight shot. I Mm-mm. feel like sometimes, you know, we have um, pods of area where people work and if they're hotel workers you know, or they work at the mall. Why don't we have like eight o'clock pick up and just have a straight shot back and forth for those people that have to drive all over to Washington and come back. I mean, it's an extra two hours. If you're paying for daycare, that's a lot. I, I just can't imagine in my head. This is what I think of is like a, a track. That's mm-hmm. a loop. And you walk up to the stop and you push a button and it like calls one of the elect- little electric pods and it just gets to you and you can get them to zero to probably 60 miles an hour. And keep Sounds them, like the George Jetson family. Like George Jetson, but we could do it. I mean, if you think of what what is a Tesla, what's the motor in a Tesla? It's like this big. And those things can go like 120 miles an hour. We don't even need that. And it can fit six people in the car. And it, if you just put it on a track, it doesn't go anywhere else other than where it says it needs to go, right? It just starts running. And, you know, you could connect that with the technology that we have. It, it can't, it's not outside of the realm of possibility, but I don't. But you have to lay down all that track. You got to lay down the track. And luckily, we have the trail system that's already there. So we don't necessarily need to figure out where to put it because we already have it. It's yeah. already there. You could just put it off to the side a little bit and you dig a trench and, you know. You have to get all that property from somebody, though. What, but the, the trail we, itself, the stra- trail property itself, know, is that who so owns that? We, the city does, or whoever is the whoever trail sits on so it seems I'm, like there's only one one shot collar in that instead of like i know a bunch but if of, you're letting people ride bikes and their scooters and walk then how's that pod going down that same piece of road with that would be like off to the it'd be off to the, the side to, of it then you have to get more property maybe it's a narrow right away it's true a narrow right away that's interesting though there's, but then you bring back power and power is not going to be an easy thing we're good point we're going to struggle with that if you look what happened in southern california this last year with the, the power situation down there and everybody plugged in their cars and then they had rolling blackouts yeah. and all that other stuff. Like that energy situation is not going to be an easy one to handle. And if we don't have power, we don't have water because most of our water comes off pumps. Yeah. I mean, even people, 
people say, why are you emptying quail? Why are you emptying these reservoirs? And it's like, because you can see what's in the mountain. But even at that, it's all pumped into those reservoirs. Yeah. And so if we can't pump, we don't have electricity to pump. We don't have water. Yeah. So it's a cycle. It's like. these All these things interconnect with each other. Yes. And trying to figure out the parts and pieces to make that work. We're just replacing Laurie Mangum at the city. And she's been over the energy department, over the power department. And I mean, it's a struggle because there's so much to manage there. Dixie Power, of course, has its part of St. George. But buying power, I didn't realize how much um, is into that. You think of the power department, you think of your line man, you know, getting it to your house, gear connection, all those things. But really buying and selling power, um, making sure that you have enough natural gas, you know, with what we're seeing with um, solar and and coal going away, and then even the hydro at Lake Powell, you know, we're going to have p- power off that this year. But there was a minute before this storm snow pack happened that we didn't know, you know, and so that's a big part of our portfolio. So when we look at that, how we manage the power and how we educate people like don't go in and plug in your car at five o'clock and turn up your air conditioner because it really strips the grid. You know, we, we're going to, we have to fire something else up to offset that, which hurts us all. So I think, you know, that's another part of education that people get so focused in on water that they they forget about power and our energy costs are going to go up. I know Santa Clara, I think Santa Clara and Washington both had a 10% hike. I think ours is too, but that's because Laurie's done such a great job of buying natural gas and all that. But there, that's a lot of applying that just as important as water. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say, when you go back to like, just plug it in, well, and not all chargers are created equal, you know, some yeah. can really charge a car, I guess, in 15 minutes and some of them are trickle all night long. And if everybody was to plug into that high powered charger then what would happen well and and not only that but then did you actually save any money by plugging it in versus getting gas and then are you actually impacting the environment any differently if if the power that you're plugging into your car comes from a coal power plant or you know another you know supposedly non-green uh energy source it's yeah we've muddied the waters with power and energy i think it's confusing to a lot of people I don't always agree with you amps, but I always you amps. That's the it's the Utah Power. The, it's like the Utah Power Association. Association. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. And so they come down bef- before the league meetings and have a meeting every year. And then we went to Nashville last year and listened that on a national level. But one of the things that was um, fascinating to me is how clean coal has got, and it still has a black eye. That it's just almost as clean or cleaner than natural gas. But people still have that negative con- connotation that California is still putting n- nuclear off. Like they keep restoring their nuclear power plants, even though they're dumping into their own oceans. You know, Idaho's got a nuclear power plant that they think is wonderful. St. George City didn't buy into it yet. But that's one of the things that as a federal government, as the state, we've got to do better at because it's important and important. Plus, you know, there's a lot of coal in Utah. And if we don't have to drag that energy across state lines, it's good for the state. Natural gas primarily comes from the south. Our our, um, lines are not great. If you look what comes into Utah, there's probably two natural gas lines. Mm -hmm. We have coal in the state. We have, you know. Yeah, I think last time I checked this last year, and I know they're phasing out a bunch of the coal power plants, but Mm -hmm. it's like 80% of the power comes from coal. Yes. Yeah, 80%. And up at Huntington, those guys are just like, well, it's in Emory County, you know. And some of those coal power plants are not clean. Some of them are not, but they've done a lot to clean them up. It, they've done, they've done, they've done a semi adequate job. Like I, I still have the, the newer up- updated facilities from top to bottom are engineered to where, yeah, they're going to capture, you know, a lot of the carbon emissions. Um, and even new diesel trucks, like what comes out the tailpipe of a brand new diesel truck and with a lot of the, um, different systems they put in there. It's just like water vapor coming out the, you know, the back of the truck. So like this idea that a diesel truck is dirty for the environment versus what actually the new technology really is. Those are two comp- completely different things. But um, just the lack of power and availability of power and the cost of that, you know, something we all need to consider. And and luckily we have city officials to kind of help us through it. But I think we need to educate ourselves as to 
what really are the biggest problems and what should we be focusing on? What do you think we should be focusing on the most? What's the what's the biggest problem? Well, it really comes back to it's a federal level and what the regulation is there because okay. they're controlling it. And I look at California, they're all for having diesel. Will the big trucks be all um, elect- EVs? And, I, and I'm like, how are you getting the power for those and where are the batteries going when you're done? How good yeah. is that for our environment? Yeah. Where, where's the dump for that? Yeah. And and what it takes to get those batteries. Have you? There's a Cobalt Red. It's a book called uh, Cobalt Red. It's about the cobalt plant, uh, mining facilities in Africa and how it's basically like people with hammers, like kids, pregnant women, literally with hammers, digging into the ground to get cobalt so that we could put them in our lithium ion b- batteries so that we can get another, you know, 100, like, 100 miles off of our battery. It's like blood diamonds. It's like blood diamonds. Exactly. Exactly. We just change. We've changed the mineral that we're hunting after uh, at the cost of what, right? Yeah. At the cost of sad. who. Cost of who, And really? who. And who. Yeah. And, and all up and down the, the spectrum. So what do you think? Do you think we're, it's adequate? Is the water plan that we have currently adequate for the next five years? For the next five years. Um, Scott Taylor is our water department department head shout out to scott taylor shout out to scott taylor you know scott i think gotta be not the coolest job ever i i can't imagine the questions and things that he gets all the time but well the knowledge he has and the infrastructure knowledge he has yeah and um he knows his guys and his his staff his the women and men that work for him and he knows water i think this last year he has spent more time trying to working with the communities around us with the water district mapping water to make sure all the water is accounted for, which is a a pretty big burden. And then sitting down with those people and he represents the city when he does this and he does it well about trying to be a good community partner with water. At the same time, he's very forward thinking. He, um, with the graveyard wash project, which is a project up here by Santa Clara and Ivans that the water will come out of the wastewater treatment plant and mm-hmm. will be stored there. Um, You'll see that put into motion. There's, I think the environmental studies are done on that. But as we've expanded that wastewater treatment plant, and it is those the people that work down there are so proud of it. It's so clean. But you know that was um, St. George again takes care of a lot of the wastewater for the area. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how that comes out because once the water is diverted out of the Virgin River, it's your water share until it's back into the Virgin River. So if it's Santa Clara or Ivan's flushing their toilets that goes through the wastewater treatment plant, it's their water for secondary use. Mm-hmm. And the question again comes, who paid for what? Who's paying for it to be clean and who's paying it to be stored? And how's that reallocated as far as cost, even though it's your water share? I think that's one of the things that, you know, those attorneys are going to figure out and work through because as we, as we use water differently, mm-hmm. And as a second time and maybe a third time, because you think, so it goes into the ground, so you're not going to use it typically secondary water that way, but who knows what's going to happen down the road if we get it that clean. And then if the Warner Valley project, you know, that's probably 10 years off, but we did get some funding from it for this last legislative session. Mm-hmm. We did, we got quite a bit of money, right? To start that project. But until we get through the environmental studies, we don't know have that, but the, you know, that's another one where we could make secondary water. From from the wastewater treatment plant plus the runoff and clean it up. So mm-hmm. those are those are things. But I think Scott does a really good job at um, getting things done, making things happen. The they did a project, got the arsenic out of the the gunlock well, so we can use that water again for drink drinking water. So there's just little bits and pieces. I think you can't say enough about the residents. Yeah, because they're the ones who really without any ordinance passed, the residents the last two years just like, okay, we're taking some ownership. We're paying attention. It takes four hours for water to go through that waste, go through the water treatment plant out of Sand Hollow. When it puts a different spin on it when you think, it takes four hours to process that water. I turn on my tap, that took four hours to clean that water up. But Interesting. But, but And that's going on your lawn too if you're using culinary water. So you think about all the energy power as well that goes to do that for us to have drinking water compared to how it was 150 years ago it's pretty remarkable yeah so so you think it is adequate you think for our, five years for five 
And then what about the 10 year outlook? I think if we get the, I think if we get the um, Warner Valley project up and going, uh-huh. I think that the, and we can um, use the secondary water. It's going to be a great help because right now by ordinance, if you have a project, you have to have secondary water stubbed in. Right. So and then that's th- been going for like five years now, I think. Yeah. Something, maybe seven years. St. George now has electronic meters. I don't know if your city does. Uh, Washington City does. uh, St. George does. I don't think Ivan's Ivan's does yet. But it's pretty spectacular when you look at like, oh, how much water did I just use on my lawn? Yeah. And how much important is that lawn to me? Just awareness. Am I using that water? Do I have a sprinkler leak? Do I have all these other things? So if you become aware of that, you become more water wise and just um, it changes your use, changes your philosophy on water. But I think for five years, we're good. I think if we get the Warner Valley project in, I think longer. And then technology is always changing. Mm-hmm. And Scott's like, you know, you might see the day that we use that wastewater treatment and it's all cleaned up and it comes back into your culinary system. Yeah. So you're you're talking about water share. It has to ultimately go back down the river. I, I Maybe come back to that. I wasn't quite so sure what you're talking we about. we divert water. So we, t- we take water out of the Virgin mm-hmm. and then we got to put it back. And then we have to put it back. We have to put it back a hundred percent of it. Um, I don't know what the allocation is, but there's a, there's Certain... a portion of it that has to go back down to Lake Mead. That's part of the the agreement, the agreement. So when you do that, even though they're reneging on the agreement with Lake Powell, we, we have to keep, we, we have to keep it going keep here. In but the, down to the cities, like, up to a point, we don't necessarily have to keep that agreement. Right. Everything in the saying, renegotiation yeah. happens, you know, some things change. When do you think that renegotiation for like those allocations, where are we at in that? Yeah, they're negotiating. Currently, right now, right? Mm-hmm. It, I know they were in Vegas a couple of months ago. Okay. Negotiating that. That's one of those things that I don't really get into. I just hear the feedback. Like, they're yeah, down they're there. They're just, working on it. They're trying to make it happen. Yeah. But I, I, I interviewed uh, Governor Cox, Lieutenant Governor at the time. Yes. Uh, right before he was um, took office in 2019. I saw that. And, uh, oh, I think you were on that call, right? No, I just saw, I watched it. Cause oh, yeah. Because it, it, uh, it was a small group of... Yeah. Of people that listened in, but I had, you know, the developers on asking a question and they all asked about water. And it was like, that was our plan A, B, and his plan A, B, and C. We had only a couple of attorneys working on, you know, the committee in the renegotiation because they thought it was cut and dry and like, hey, the agreement's the agreement. This isn't going to be a problem. And then all of a sudden, Colorado and Nevada and California all had issues with it, Arizona included. So, but the Colorado uh, legal team was like, 12 or 13 attorney legal team on this water issue where we had like two guys in a basement down in Garfield County or something. I don't know. It made, he made it seem like we didn't have really a whole lot of people up until he took office, but it sounds like everybody's gotten sped up and now they're in negotiations in Vegas. I didn't hear that. So. Yeah. And I, and I think we're going to see that. And I think Utah has stepped up. We are behind though. Yeah. We are behind, but hopefully we get it. But back to the local part of that, you divert that water. If like Santa Clara's or Ivan's is 20% of that water that comes out that's allocated. Mm-hmm. That's that's their water share. If it gets through the wastewater treatment plant, there's a percentage that has to go back to those communities secondary water. Right. Because it's still your water while it's out and of the it, ditch. And it goes into graveyard. And that's where we're pulling it from, right? And graveyard. It will be halted at graveyard. But right. then out of that out of that so many acre feet of water, 20% of that would still belong to Santa Clara bec- or Ivan's or whatever the St. George right. parties because it's your water till it goes back into the ground. And, and it, those are all going to be pumped together. The reservoirs are all going to be connected still, right? Because I think right now all the reservoirs are connected where they can pump from one into the other. Is that currently? Well, right? there's a ton of, I think there's like 300 miles of pipe that and just, they can mix water. And that's part of the things with, with the same thing with power, like, we're on a grid. The and that's where the Water Conservancy District comes into play it. and manages that. Okay, okay. Because they have to do that. They mix water because if, you know, if the arsenic level, if this is not great, if it's not potable water, they can make that so it is drinkable, usable water. Mm-hmm. So that's what they do. And that infrastructure underground is just crazy Vast amazing. And amazing, yeah. And the Toker Reservoir is up and going. I mean, they're starting to yeah, they're working digging on and that. working on it, yep. So all these little things that the Conservancy District is doing. When you look at Iron County, what does Iron County have for water? I mean, you go to you go to utahwater.org and you look at what falls. It's really just whatever's on the north half of, you know. I mean, they have Bryan Head. They have some water sources, but they don't. They're not catching it anywhere, right? And they gave up Kolob. 
They gave up Colorado Reservoir in 1980. And, and so do they, they have not. do they have some plans on? Oh, Enix got a drill going in the ground every five minutes. So they're just drilling well water, and they're taking water shares back. Interesting, you, you know what I mean? Because they didn't they didn't plan for water, and that's mm-hmm. one thing I feel like Washington da- County again is a big community. The water district really has worked together for the better, but it does take all the communities to work together. Yeah, it does, and we've had a ton of growth that's happened over the last. You know, really, twenty years. We we got to we got to say what what's happened over the last twenty years isn't uh, normal. Well, it's not. It's not just like a regular task, right? This is kind of a monumental. This is like a big task that um, everybody has before them, right? You know, as a Saint George, not only are we man- managing the residents, but we're also managing the vast amounts of tourism that comes through here, and and the the burden that takes on on towns is is pretty big, and it's it's an unfair share of that burden when you think of other towns in different areas right so it's not an easy job you don't have an easy job well i think you, i somewhere i read like the population of saint george can change 20 percent in one weekend and i think oh I, it feels that way yeah that's, and i think you look at easter weekend like it was jam-packed when we had those championships for the iron man it was i mean residents got fatigued from that mm-hmm. like when do i get my park back when do i get my street back when do i get my parking place back yeah yeah, and that's and that's that's that mix. We built the community on drawing tourism and all these parks. We have fifty parks, right? I think St. George City owns four golf courses, mm-hmm. right? They have, you know, so so much have banked on, hey, come here and hang out and enjoy the weather, right? And now what is the residual impact of that being promoted for you know, and, fifteen years and And then to to point it out, those people are not making the money. Those employees those service industry employees are not making enough money to live here. To live here, yeah. So that's that's the hard part of that. Yeah. I think it, encouraging wage growth at, everywhere we can from our local businesses, but then I think it's a tough burden on the city, but a, a necessary one on zoning and, and making sure we got a good game plan and a map to make sure the developers are encouraged to do what the map says, right? And then, you know, at the same time, you know, set some expectations on as things change, we're, we're willing to do what's necessary to help the communities. Right. And the private, private sector is the one that has to really pitch in on the housing side, at least from my perspective, my perspective too. I, I think the city, the best the city can do is potentially not get caught up in, um, you know, a lot of the minor details and say, Hey, we're going to set an expectation. And then, you know, if I can't help but think of like, the way that it looks and the exact, you know, number of, you know, feet in the height of the building and it needs to have this specific paint. And, you know, some of these times it seems like we get caught up in some of the things that aren't necessarily as important, but then we've had these times where we've said, okay, you could paint it, whatever. And then now it's like bright pink or something. And and I think our corridors, I think we look at that and I was not planning commission when big shots came in, but people are like, Protect a corridor and then put big shots right there. Could he not put up against the hillside? You know what I mean? And those people at Sun River are like, what were you thinking? That shining in our, you know, on our homes at night because the big lights. At the same time, you know, you people have property rights. They get to develop, things like that. Yeah, but, just, it is the freeway right there, right? Like, you're like, oh. But when you drive into St. George, it, you know what I mean? Like, to have that right there is... You know, aesthetically, is that pleasing? But that's to your point. What's aesthetically pleasing to one person may I, not be to another. Some people might be like, oh, look, they got a, a golf thing. Look at the mountain. Holy cow, look at the Red Rocks. I think especially coming up from the south, I mm-hmm. think it's beautiful looking at the mountain. I'm not necessarily looking at what's right immediately off the freeway. But at the same time, I could see those those perspectives. And it's something the city council has to weigh no matter what you – whether you like it or not, public hearings are public hearings. You got to go listen to them. Sometimes you're there for – you and know, I think I think part four or of it, five like, hours. I've been here. I've lived here a long time. So these are relationships. Some of these people that lived here longer than I have, and then now they want to sell their property and profit off it. And you step back and say, "Love you to pieces," but this isn't the right thing for the city. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard thing. That's hard. Yeah, but it's the right thing. And I think when you look, at, you go to other cities and you look how they developed. And do you want a five story building on the curb? on the sidewalk on, you know what I mean? Like right built to the sidewalk or do you want some space taken back and have a little, have a little area 
but we're not going to do park strip for grass. You know, we can't do too much landscaping right there. So what's the purpose of pulling it off the curb and gutter? Right. So you have to look at all those things. But then you go to other cities that just feels like a Grand Canyon. You're like, well, we don't want that either. Yeah. But then you go back to property rights. Yeah. And the people's right to develop. Yeah. It's a tough balance. And and you have to realize it's not all going to develop. It's not all going to develop this year. So we put a plan out. We we put out the best plan. And then we know things are going to morph a little bit as time changes and needs change and technology changes. Yep. That's going to change. But that downtown plan, you think, oh, was it going to be three stories on Tabernacle? How's that going to look? It's not going to be that way this week. And the last yeah. thing we want to do is chase people out of their homes. Those, yeah. Some of those people are 100 years old or 80 years old and – they don't want to chase out of their homes at the end of life either. And yeah. so to be able to protect some of that historic quality of downtown, why allowing some change is important. Yeah. But then we look at Little Valley, who I don't think was planned. And you go down there, you have to drive five miles to get to a grocery store either direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the roadways are not there. I mean, 3000 East is, you know, getting widened. But there's not really that gathering spot commercially. I've heard the stories too. The, er- the early development plans for that wasn't that, that it was all residential, but the town and the cities, they didn't want commercial anywhere. They're like, I don't want it anything else because we were going from ag to residential and residential to commercial. And they're like, we don't want commercial. We'll just do residential, right? And that was the- It was hard to let ag go. I'm sure. I'm sure. Particularly for me. But, you know, I love- I- I love the cattle. I love I love the open space. I love the green. There's people's right to develop though, but in saying that, there was a big pushback. And but you know, hopefully there's a little bit of green out there that we can still develop some commercial in that just so we don't get the traffic coming back to yeah. the city every time. Yeah. Well, it's a tough puzzle. It's a tough puzzle. But that's part of the master plan. We're doing that this week. Yeah. We have from four to eight with planning commission versus having to sit down on looking at the whole city, not just we're done with downtown, but looking at the whole city. And I think the um, St. George Musical Theater is going to be a huge asset to South Main Street when that gets built. They're going to build a beautiful building. I think that will really help South Main Street develop and grow where it's just not right now and get that building. Where is that going exactly? It's just going south of where the Kmart Plaza was. Okay. I don't know what they're calling that these days. Seems like it changed a little bit, but it's just you know where Anderson Lumber used to be, uh-huh. just behind behind that. Okay. So I think um, they're raising some money for that, and the city's leasing the property for nothing for a hundred years. Why wouldn't they just sell it? Why doesn't the city? Why is the city? I don't think they. I don't think it? they. I don't think they want to buy it. I don't. I don't think they have the money to buy it. The people that want to do it. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna subsidize it. We are. Do you think that's the right thing to do? Should the city own? Because because it's my opinion, the city shouldn't necessarily own land. Like it doesn't make sense why why the governing city should own land. Private private citizens should own land, and then that way it opens up for the best o- availability for the free market. The the city's going to say, "Hey, this is the zoning and this is the development plan that we have," but we don't own the land, so we don't have a vested interest in what goes there. We do that through the planning commission and, and through zoning. So I, I'm always curious, you know, when you when you hear stuff like that, because who who ends up subsidizing that, and then it's the well, it's the taxpayers. Isn't taxpayers. It? Did they get a vote on whether or not that no, money they did gets not spent? Get a vote that I mean, they voted for elected officials, right? So that that's where that vote came in. I, and I, I love the music. I love the arts. I love art around the corner. I like I, and I appreciate it. And, and arts typically can't be done on its own. It takes governmental. Um, oh maybe not oversight, but intervention to make it happen a lot of times uh, because the artistic don't necessarily have a business mind. They have an artistic mind. And so they're, they're not necessarily focused on making a profit. They're focused on doing a really good job at playing music or, you know, doing their craft. So that's, that's interesting. And, but you were excited about it. You know, I think, I, I think this project's been, they've been at the social hall, I think for a long period of time. And, Uh They've been before council, before I got to council to have this happen. And they've tried to work with different, the county, different organizations. Things. Yeah. Mm, anyways, and it came down to land list. They, and they, they were happy with the piece of property. I think they're going to be really happy long-term. I think it'll be a benefit to St. George city to have that commercial area develop even further. 
So I think it is going to be a benefit for the city. They're going to have to raise a lot of money to get it built. It's the same thing with the Cox Auditorium that they're re- rebuilding. Yeah, and that's mainly done by private entities or no? $28 million by the state of Utah. Oh, that's right. I think Ips, uh, Don was saying that they just got that passed, right? Yeah. I think I was watching a video. Uh-huh. And then the 10 more million dollars, 10 or 12 more million dollars will have to come through um, private donors. Private donors. And I think, you know, it's two different. So they're not even 50% in in private donors. So the, oh, oh, more than more than 50% is being foot by the, the state of Utah. Interesting. Yeah. But, uh, you know, p- people enjoy that here. And I think it is good. I think art is good. I'm not as art driven as other people are. Mm-hmm. But it seems to be a community need, and it draws people to the area. You look at what Tuacon does. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an important aspect. I don't think it's the only aspect that's important, though. Yeah, it's just one one piece of the big pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as we kind of we're winding down, it's eleven. It's almost eleven. Yeah. We could keep going. I got a lot more questions. (laughs) You're so good to me. We're getting close to the end. (laughs) Well, I. You know, what do you think so far as, as we've been talking through, you know, what are, what are some other thoughts? So what, what are some other, the, what would, what would be, who do you want to see run? Do you, is there somebody, cause it's going to come in out after the, the deadline. So if, if you were to pick some people to run for city council, who would it be? Well, if I was going to pick somebody to run for city council, it would be somebody who just doing it for the right reasons. Not You don't have a name. You don't have like, man, I really, this person active in the community, I could see them doing good or, because obviously I, I don't want to know who you don't want to run. Just thought like maybe a little encouragement from, and it'll be after the deadline, but is there somebody in town that, that you like, hey, this, this would be a good person that I think would make good decisions that could throw their name in the, the race? No, I, I, I'm just going to say like Jimmy Hughes is somebody I would support. Jimmy's always supported me. Jimmy and I don't always agree. We had a kind of falling out over switch point early on because he's a huge advocate for switch point Mm -hmm. and they needed some additional funding last year. And so we're at the legislature. He's like, you got to see this up here in Salt Lake and they had the point and it was for over 55 people. Mm -hmm. And what Carol did up there was amazing. And the men and women up there, some of them were veterans some of them just found them at the end of the road, but those people were driving the bus to take people to their doctor's appointment. They have a commercial kitchen they were cleaning out. Now it's up and running and they- It's a real community. It's like, hey, you might be homeless, but you belong somewhere. Have and you been to that place? Well, I've just, because I've, I've donated a couple of times, I've been to their their galas. Um, I think I think I might've been to one of their early meetings because they're only about f- seven years old down here. Down here, right? I think it's been going a little bit longer. But I don't know. Like, Jimmy's been on the board the yeah, whole time. And, and, G- and Jimmy owns it. Jimmy just loves it. He loves it. I think it's a great project. I think there's a lot of But a the lot of ownership those it. people have in that community, yeah. and they signed a caseworker and all this other stuff. And Jimmy's like, and Sean Guzman was there too. Like, this is the best. But they needed more funding. And so on the budget thing, anyway, then it came out that they're, they're and it was for the hotel up on um, 1000 yep. East, uh-huh. the point. Studio six. I don't know what it's called. The point. Anyway, so it was for men. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, when they got through switch point that these men had somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where's the women, Jimmy? Yeah. And he goes, well, you know, this is just, we're just doing this for whatever. And I said, I can't support that. Like, I'm a real estate agent. I know about fair housing. Like, and I'd been over to the, um, over to the, over to purgatory to the receiving center that they just broke ground on during that same period of time for when people get arrested and they're trying to sort out mentally or whether they're on drugs or whether instead of taking the hospital 24 or 48 hours. So they're just breaking ground on that. But when I stand there, I was standing with a bunch of police officers and legislators and the rest of the city council wasn't there. And I listened and I heard them say, we've got to do something about this, just bail out stuff. Because we don't require drug court anymore. And so these people are just getting out of jail. They're not going to drug court. They're not getting into a residential facility treatment. They're going back on the street, and then we rearrest them. Mm -hmm. We need to do something. And, you know, the crazy thing about that is it's really hurting our female population. Yeah. Because if we can get a female, a woman cleaned up, she usually has children, somebody else, and she will course correct. But because they're not forced into somewhere else or have a different program to get to, to land in after they get out of treatment, then nothing. 
And I said, Jimmy, I'm, I'm going to like vote no. I'm going to say no. I'm going to make a big deal. And, and Jimmy went back and pitched it and said, you know, this has been brought to my attention and women need to be there. This last month at um, the event they had down at Dixie Center, Dominique was one of the people. And mm-hmm. she had come full circle. And she was living in that hotel. And yeah. I was sitting by Jimmy and I said, you know, we don't get to sit on every board as a as a council person, but you represent me. You represent my voice. And thank you for listening to me and having that woman yeah. have a place to reside and get on with her life and be a productive part of a, a productive resident of St. George. Yeah. And so to me, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy, and I don't always agree, but we're always able to find the solution. And when you brought up the thing about, you know, we change commissioners, we change city council, we change administrators, we change all this stuff. Yeah. Jimmy's got some history. And sometimes we're talking about something as a as a city council or even with county commissioners, and Jimmy can shed that light on it because he has been there for a minute. Experience. Mm-hmm. And he does listen to people. But but to me, it's like, to your point, like we switched this council all the way over, and Michelle Tanner and I are the two, and we have three new ones. And I have a lot of confidence in Michelle, but then we need some continuity. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you think like, all three of them are going to run again? I th- I do I I I anticipate them too. Yeah, I, you know, I would think so. Yeah, well, it'll be an interesting election cycle for sure. I, I'm, it's the most important. It's I'm important. With, it is important. It's extremely important. We have a great city manager who's guiding us in the right direction, who is listening to city council, but he still is the one to say, "I take direction from city council." Staff does not lead the city council does. And he needs a good counsel yeah. to support him. What would you, what would you say to all those people that just moved here to St. George from somewhere else? What, what would be something that you'd want? What would be a message from St. George to them? I'd say get to know your neighbors. I, you know, I moved after living in the same house for 20 years, I moved to a neighborhood. Where I didn't know anybody, one neighbor that I sold the house to. And I, I got on, um, some app, it's not next door, it's something else. And a group me. I said, we've got to know each other for a safe neighborhood. We have to know each other. We have to be able to have a conversation. I need to know who your kids are. I need to know if your husband had a heart condition. Like we need to know some general things about each other. Love your neighbor. And then you you start those conversations. And what's important to you? What's important to me in the city is not going to be important to them. But sometimes when you get a little bit of history about how come people are making the decisions they are on both sides of that, where they came from, what they learned, what they as a long term resident, what you know, that whole conversation, if it never happens, I look at our interfaith council. I don't know if you know any of those people. Of, they, I don't know if there's 13 of them, but they're, they represent all the different religions in Washington County. Now, even in my religion, we have people who disagree mm-hmm. about yeah. religion. Right. Those people are doing what's best for the community. And they pray before each one of our council meetings. And every time they're higher power, you can feel that presence of who they're praying to. Yeah. And and I think they really set the bar. So I say get engaged in all whatever, community somewhere. Plug in somewhere. In, into some religion mm-hmm. or whatever spirituality you do. And then get involved in a civic club. Get involved even if you don't have kids. Get involved in your PTA. Be that reading grandma or grandpa. But in but get into a civic club. I look at what the Elks Lodge does, Exchange Club. I'm going to be sorry I started in on, but the Lions Club. You go down those those groups of people yeah. who baseline build this community. It's the service. It's those connections. It's picking up trash. When the city said, let's go pick up trash, that, that you feel ownership in your community. And then you get to know residents on a different level. When you're sweating with them or you're on a bike, I, you know, like they did the bike roll last night with the police officers. When you get to know people on that level, then we all get to look in the same. Yeah. It, you don't walk through. Cause I came from California and I went from just being, I'm just a, a number in a crowd. You know, I, I rarely ran into people that I knew on a regular basis. Cause I, I lived in Huntington beach, but I worked in Downey. Right. Yeah. It was an hour up the 405. My wife worked in Irvine, which was 45 minutes down the 405. And you know, when we went to the grocery store from home, we didn't know anybody. We didn't know it. We barely knew our neighbors. And then the ones that were fighting, we didn't want to know because we were just listening to them yell at each other. Right. And so it's, 
it's an interesting dynamic moving here from a place like that because um, our community access is right here. We could we can meet everybody and see everyone and our our city officials know who they are and see them in in the grocery stores. And I think the accessibility here is still awesome because it's still a small town. We still have a small town feel to it. And I love that. And I don't want to I don't want to lose that. But it does take active participation from people that move here from out of the area. They got to get involved and and not be afraid inform themselves. I think it's that thing of like that little bit of insecurity. And I know better than you. I, I'm a little probably, bit insecure yeah. about speaking up, but I know more than you do. And it's like, how do we bridge that? How do we like, you feel like you're involved mm-hmm. and I, and I give my thoughts is still respected and appreciated, even though it's different than yours. Like, where do we bridge that gap in, in our community? But being, Finding common ground and then mm-hmm. moving forward. Right. Yes. But yeah. I think service for me, service is key. Yeah. Well, cool. I, I think, um, we could keep going for a while, but would you come back? Would you come back and do another one? Maybe, maybe do like a post election, like, Hey, this is what's happened. Or it, at least help me keep, keep me up to date on the infrastructure stuff. Cause it is tough. It gets overwhelming and hopefully, you know, we won't necessarily have to do the one other long, thing but... is that gap Canyon parkway. That would be a big deal for people in Santa Clara and Ivins that, that we started the annexation process of that. Yeah. We get Ga- gap Canyon parkway and that's where the board office is uh-huh. off of Dixie drive. Okay. And it'll loop back around behind Devario. Yep. That, That'll be helpful. And, for and, sure helpful. And to get all that traffic off Dixie Drive. And yep. then hopefully um, we the Western Corridor, that at some point. I know they're meeting on the Northern Corridor again this week. So I was thinking the Northern Corridor. I was like, can't they just dig a, a – can we just do a tunnel? Like completely avoid – I don't know. Someone call Elon Musk and say, hey, well, you just, it's just red rock. Like, yeah, you know, you can dig through this thing super easy. Could you just give us a tunnel and then we won't even have to disturb the turtles yeah. and we'll just pop it right out over right by red, red hills. And yeah. you know, it's a, that's a tough one. You know, a lot of people don't want that to go through. And truthfully, in my mind, I'm like, ah, is it really gonna, is it really gonna alleviate all that much? You look at what's going yeah. over to Ivan's. Uh huh. You look at that big development that's just being built out. Oh yeah, the Black Desert plus plus a bunch of some of the other things. Yeah, got going you look on. at that and you think of that. If all that goes right through St. George or Red Hills Parkway, what's that going to look like? Yeah, I mean it. It'll definitely be a be a lot, but then we still kind of still dump it to Red Hills Parkway. It still ends up kind of on Red Hills Parkway. We only get some people coming from, you know, the sp- Spring Green Springs. Space. But why why wouldn't you just? Is it going to really be faster if I get off on Washington Parkway? When the, there's a hospital built there and everything, is it still going to be faster for me to get off in Washington County or Washington Parkway and get to Red Hills that way? Or do I just still go down St. George Boulevard, make a ride on 1,000 and get on the hill, the Red Hills Parkway? Well, I think it'll give people options so it will hopefully not back Potentially, yeah. Yeah. I do, I do like the idea, though, the, the backside Santa Clara, you know, relieving. I sat in that. That's the light that I've sat through, you know, two, three times. Is mine's Sunset and Dixie. You know, that's the spot right there. So hopefully, hopefully we acquire that property and get that done. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for coming on. This You're is, too nice. This, is, this it's so helpful. It's helpful for me. I learned I learned so much from this. Just this simple conversation. I learned a ton. I hope you know the 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 goal of the podcast is I just want people in Washington County to watch this. Right? Like it's just like a radio show for you know um, local people. We don't have a news station. Hurricane oh. doesn't even. We, we don't barely have a newspaper. St. George News is de facto a newspaper because Spectrum. You know, it's faded into Nothing. oblivion, right? And I don't even think St. George News, remember it was a Facebook page? Mm-hmm. It was a Facebook page before that yes. was just selling ads to local businesses. It wasn't even like a news outlet. And they just kind of picked up the ball and they just kept running. So it's another just kind of de facto thing that we ended up landing on where do we have some better platforms that we could utilize as a city? And hopefully this podcast will help, you know, keep in the city engaged and informed. So... Well, I feel like this, you're authentic. I think you're doing it for that reason. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't think you're driving your own narrative, which is important, which, which. This is, it's truthfully, you. this, this is where it does help, help me is that I really don't, I don't want to move again. I want to stay in St. George and I want my boys to stay in St. George. And I just look down the road. And I'm like, oh man, it's going to be so hard for them to stay here. It's going to be hard for them to stay here. If, if we don't, if we don't get engaged and do my role as an adult, like I had to realize like, oh yeah, I guess I'm. I'm one of the adults now. I forgot that you grow up and you're no longer a kid. Cause in my head, I still think I'm 21 and I backpacked Europe and, you know, went to college and thought I knew everything. And now at 36, I look back and I'm like, Oh, I think I'm an adult now. And I should probably 
you know, take that active role. And I think a lot of my generation has kind of been in and out of this because we've jobs and all that. This the younger voices aren't typically heard in in Southern Utah. I think it's a lot of the like forty percent of our county is over fifty five, right? So the the retiree community ends up having the biggest voice. So I want to make sure that everybody's Your you know represented. Important. Yeah. Well, and then the one coming up too. Uh, but I think that's part of the, we have to keep them engaged. Yeah. And if we get negative, because it's a negative cycle we have on the national level, like we need to tell the good story. We need to tell you do matter. that A you, full story. Yeah. Like they got to get the whole full story. Mm-hmm. What's good? What's not good? What's, what are we excited about in the future? St. George has got so many bright spots. Um, so many exciting things that have come just in the five years. Cause we, we've been here seven years. So I moved here in 2015 and we went to Zion Christmas Day in 2015. We went, oh no, it was 20, yeah, 2015. Nobody was in Zion. I drove all the way up to the the last trail, all the way up, no trams going. We saw like two people and it was so awesome. And three years later, they had trams going and you couldn't even access the canyon without going on a tram on Christmas Day. In three years, it went from that. Yeah, that it's an insane explosion, right? And it is. So I just, I had like this little window glimpse of what it was like before. And then now we're, it's like a, it's like a whole new world. That's that a Aladdin George song. I grew up in. A whole new world. Like a, that, the whole farmland thing out there. Yeah. The and fields, I'm like. Yeah. T- I talked to people that are born race here because there are still some. There's not a lot. Most people, it's hard to find somebody like, hey, were you. Born and raised here? Oh, yeah. You know, oh, you know. what? Well, I don't I've, remember living anywhere else but here. Yeah. And there's not a lot of those. No, it was the best place to grow up in. It was the best. Yeah. It was Mayberry. It was Mayberry. I was talking to the Hafens. Um, they have the, is it, I don't know if it's, it's an antique shop. They're right there on Santa Clara Boulevard across from City Hall. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was saying how the population sign d- didn't even change from like 1950 to like the 70s. The population sign didn't change. He's like, honestly, it was just like we were in a time warp. No one moved, no new businesses. Everybody had the same businesses. We all did the same thing. You know, for 30 years, nothing changed. It was just one thing. And then Bloomington, you know, there was that first it's called, jump over the river. It's called river. refrigeration came in. Refrigeration, air, air conditioning, right? Yeah. yeah that's yeah, what that's changed. What, that's what changed. If you watch the map, uh, yeah, that's what watch the population map. map, all of a sudden. Swamp it's, coolers out. AC yeah. in, all of a sudden the Boom. the sun belt exploded. That's what it was. Yeah, it's true. I know. I sat under the swamp cooler with the popsicle a lot of summers. <laughs> that's awesome. I was up in Sandy. So I grew up in Sandy uh, until I was 15. And yeah, we had a swamp cooler up in Sandy even. But I couldn't even imagine. You know, we'd, we'd look at the weather growing up. It's like 100 degrees down in St. George. It's like, I couldn't even imagine. Like it's, you know, 80 up there and I'm like laying with the washcloth on my forehead just trying to cool off you know as a kid and uh Spot coolers don't work in humidity either so in august it exactly didn't even work. it wasn't even working nope. but it's a it's a whole whole new city and I, I hope this engages some people and i hope i appreciate what you're doing okay well I, i'm gonna keep doing it then okay. it gives me encouragement I'll keep you're going. awesome thank you